Hello listeners and welcome to a very special episode of Sportspiel, our 50th ever episode we have produced. Yes, combining our regular shows with our specials, we have now reached our half century of episodes since myself and Will started recording in April 2017. In that time, we have talked about plenty of issues and some of the most important pieces of sports news around. But we've also got to hear the stories of some of Britain's most talented, inspiring and promising athletes directly from the people themselves. Our feature interviews are key to what we do. We like to show the human side and give our guests the freedom and flexibility to talk. So to mark our 50th episode, we thought it would only be right to organise for a very special athlete to come on and talk about their life in sport. They don't come with much more talent than speed skater Elise Christie. The 2017 world champion is one of the world's best in her sport. She is a self-declared goofball and is a hugely engaging character. She has also had more than her fair share of ups and downs, much of them in the public eye. Elise solidified her status as one of the best in the world during a stunning 2017, where she became world champion and was voted the Sunday Times Sportswoman of the Year. Yet if you only followed her performances at Winter Olympics, then you'll know she has ticked virtually every box of bad luck. There have been falls, disqualifications, injury, and of course social media abuse. But now, with the memories of Pyeongchang 2018 still fresh in the mind, Elise's comeback from her injuries disdained at the Games is fully underway. But it has no way dampened her spirits. The Scot is still as determined as ever to be the best, and a foray into the world of long track speed skating, as well as short track, is also now on the cards. In this special episode, Elise talks in great depth about her life in speed skating, from starting out as a kid, to her Winter Olympic lessons, to becoming the best in the world. We also talk about the dangers of social media, the prospect of long track, as well as what life is like with, and now without, her best friend Charlotte Gilmartin in training and competition. What comes out in this interview is an athlete who is as bubbly and entertaining as she is talented. And no matter what the haters on social media might say, you can't keep this goofball down. Welcome back everyone to our latest athlete feature interview and this time around we have someone very special for you. A 10 time European gold medalist, a 2017 world champion, she is simply one of the best in the world in her sport. But of course people will remember what happened at this year's Winter Olympics, something that has led to her recently being nominated for the most inspirational moment at the Games category in the Team GB Awards. But before we talk about any of that, it's a delight to welcome Elise Christie to the show. Welcome to the podcast, Elise. Hey, yeah. How is everything? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good, it's good. It's just, I've just got back into the full time swing of training again, so it's been rough, to be honest. Um, a bit of a shock to the system, but no, it's good. It's nice to be back doing what I love properly again, you know? Yeah, straight back into the hard graft now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, we've got Worlds at the end of this year in March, so that'll be the, the main focus this season. Yeah, exactly. Well, I suppose we had better start with kind of short track speeding, uh, speed skating in itself. Uh, and some may or may not know your background. It kind of started in figure skating. What was it about yeah. short track that made it the perfect sport for you when you were a kid? Well, I think for me, like, it was always naturally very, like, fluent and um, had a good technique to skate right away and um, so figure skating obviously is the more common sport, the more, more known sport in the UK and I was doing that but you know it didn't feel like quite right for me, it just felt like something wasn't, something was missing in a way for me and it was kind of like the adrenaline side of it, um, you know I didn't, I'm not so elegant and I guess um, <laughs> flew in in, in, in in the way I moved, so I much preferred going on just racing and skating as fast as you can and trying to be the fastest person out there, um, and that was when the switchover came in, it like 
you know, I was always good at skating, so it made sense to go out and do it in a way that I would like it more um, by going really fast. Yeah. So that, was that kind of where the love started from, is that you didn't have to be elegant, you could just go out all guns blazing? Yeah, and I always, my coach always in figure skating commented on my hands not being right and figure skating, so I just said I was a sloppy hand. And um, when I jumped, I could do really good jumps, but I would just like land it like I'd done nothing almost. And my presentation was never the best. So, um, so yeah, I was much more adrenaline junking. Didn't really care about how I looked and stuff like that. Yeah. And then for me, short track was mm-hmm. definitely more suited to me. So as people may be able to tell by your accent, you're obviously from Livingston in Scotland, but you moved down to yeah. Nottingham at the age of 15, I think, to train full-time at the National Ice Centre. What is that yeah, like? Was... Yeah. What's that like to leave home at such a young age, or relatively young age? Well, obviously at the time, I thought it was like the best thing in the world, uh, was getting to go away and fulfil a mad dream um, and just be like independent, not get told what to do all the time, although I did still get told what to do all the time by my coach instead. Um, but it was scary, you know, like, you know you're about to leave everything you're used to, everyone you're used to having around you at such a young age, um, and you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, especially at that point in time, short track, you know, we didn't really win many medals and things like that, so it was kind of a much better than risk to come out of full-time education and just to chase something that you never even knew you were going to be chasing after. But it was exciting at the same time, you know, it's such a big challenge. Um, and, and I'm glad I did it because it really developed me as a person as well. Yeah. What was the setup then that you had in terms of you know, people that you lived with and then the contacts you have with your coaches? It was a bit mad at the time, actually, because I went into, like, I went from training like once a month to full time training right away. So it was a massive step up in the training, and um, and at that point there was no junior program, so it was either on the national elite program, training as hard as you can, or you went there kind of thing. So I made such leaps and bounds in my performance so quickly, but normal life was much tougher because initially I moved in with a host family. So it was a bigger team coach that I didn't even know, um, and that was quite scary. And I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know. I just didn't know how to look after myself properly, you know. And um, I had to learn all that at the same time as all from full time training. And so it was quite a big change to my lifestyle. And then, um, but then quite soon after that, I actually moved out on my own um, and bought my own, oh, bought my own place. Um, that was like this tiny little flat in a really rough area of Nottingham <laughs> um, and then worked my way up from there so I did mature quite quickly and quickly like to cast of myself but yeah it was scary and it was it was hard to live on your own without your parents at such a young age for sure. Yeah I was going to say that must mean you have to grow up quite quickly while training full time. Yeah and I yeah and I think especially because my like I was quite mothered as well so I wasn't like a very kid and I didn't really leave the house often I just went to school worked hard at school and then would come home and just watch tv and sports food it was a massive adjustment for me for sure and um, just on the world I guess um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, and then obviously you just get thrown into the deep end of being made to skate around really fast and train really hard and get really sore legs all the time. <laughs> Everything was so confused and it was such a blur. Yeah. I mean, you called it the mad dream before. Were there people who just asked you, what on earth are you doing? Yeah, I think I don't think there was one person at school who thought it was a good idea or even believed it was going to happen. So a lot of people kind of thought I was just one of them kids making a story up about, oh, I was really good at this, I'm going to go do this. And they they didn't believe that. And then when I did it, they were all really shocked. Um, and I think as well, yeah, it just, there were people who were like, doubt. I mean, even I was doubting. Like I, did, I, I said to my mum, I don't, I don't want to go. I want to stay in school. I, wanna, I wanted to get my education. And I want to do this and that. And my mum was like, don't be silly. Like, um, not many people have this opportunity. Get on with it. Go do it. You can go back to education or 
whatever else in a few years if it doesn't work out. So I was like, oh, okay. And then, and then yeah, and then like three years later, I'm at an Olympic game thinking, right, well, I've got to either go home and, and get some education now or I come back at the next game and try and win a medal. And it was as simple as that, you know. I didn't see the point in going to another Olympics and just competing. I wanted to be there to try and win. So it was just, um, it was a mad few years for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And all of that seems to have paid off pretty well because I suppose it was essentially from 2010 onwards that medals started to come your way on the European stage and then there's the appearance at the Vancouver Olympics as well plus 2013 European yeah. Championships there's two goals overall silver for you as well so people kind of get the picture about success coming on pretty early but for someone who had as much potential as you um, when you were younger how difficult is it actually to translate that potential into medal winning performances is it just a natural progression or was there a moment where everything kind of clicked for you no, it was definitely not, uh, like, gradually I progressed, obviously, physically, like, anyone who's doing that amount of training would move on to an extent, but I think the difference between, te- there is a massive difference between the people who manage to make it and the ones who, I mean, everyone makes it, why everyone, you know, does what they can, um, but there's definitely a decision has to be made that changes it, and I think, you know, it was me when I got back from, Vancouver Olympics, I went there as like this excited little kid who didn't think they were ever going to go to an Olympic Games, didn't really dream of that as a child, um, basically thought it was like a playground and skated quite good there to be honest, I think I got a little bit or something um, and was like, oh, okay, and came home and was like, actually how cool would it be, well not cool but how amazing would it be to be out there and be one of those people who was actually up there with a chance to meddle in that that would be incredible and then I was like okay so what do I need to change and that was really strange because I'm already nearly athlete who trains six out of seven days a week and feels like every day I turn up and give it everything so what can what what can I actually change to make myself the best almost and so I was like okay I at the moment, I try and beat the world's best. So the first changes, the mindset changes, they have to now beat me. And that changed the way I race. It changed the, what I did in training. What I did in training wasn't just what the rest of the group did anymore. It was, this person's good at this compared to me, so what do I need to do to be better than them at that? Um, so say someone was faster over a one lap than me, then, like, okay, how can I get faster over one lap than them? Well, I need to do this in the gym and that'll add to this on the ice um, so everything became very focused on being the best at everything I could be um, whether it worked or not is another story but you know I believed it was going to work because it was very much factually based around what I seen others doing um, and then and then yeah and then I just would go out every race and be in front and stay out of trouble and initially it didn't work, you know, initially I was blowing up, people were just skiing on the outside of me and it was, but I never lost that belief that it would, it would pay off, you know, I kept the belief that it would work out and I think that's something that I've kept throughout my whole career now is like, doesn't matter what outsiders say about what happened at the Olympics, I know I went there good enough to medal, I know that in four years time I'll be good enough to medal, it doesn't mean it's going to happen, no, because our sport is mental, but um, yeah. I still have belief every day that I'm capable of winning an Olympic gold medal, just like I was of being a world champion, um, but I think it is, it's very hard to, especially in the minority sports, um, to believe that you can be the best even though there's no evidence around you that anyone else has ever done it. And moving on then to, to Sochi 2014, I think mental strength and that mental side of things is going to come out a lot of this conversation. Um, how do you describe the level of expectancy put on you ahead of those games, not just from the outer world, but maybe the expectancy that you put on yourself? Uh, Sochi was an interesting one because I think exterior, there was a lot of pressure put on me. Um, I didn't like to feel much pressure on myself because... I had only been meddling for about two to two and a half years by that point. So it wasn't like I was a 
I wouldn't have classed myself as the prolific world stage medalist. I had probably two world championship medals going into that. And um, I was still very much so progressing to get myself to that point. And I always see Pyeongchang as the main Olympics for myself. Mm. So, um, so it was quite odd because where I actually was putting pressure on myself was very different to what the public probably thought I was in. Um, I went into that knowing I can medal, not expecting it was going to happen though. Um, and just, but what actually happened was I was actually getting a lot better than I expected to be, and um, and was probably yeah capable of winning gold medals. Which I think a lot of people around me, my teammates and my coach, would have said they thought that anyway. But to be honest, it wasn't the expectation I had on myself. I was hoping to try and maybe pick up a medal but um, but I never seen it as something that was a given or something that was likely to happen at all whereas in, I think I was portrayed in the public eye to be the biggest medal host of the game mm -hmm. one, well not maybe the biggest but one of them yeah and we all know what happened then <clears throat> at Sochi um with the three disqualifications and then there's the social media abuse on the side of things as well does that kind of still shock you then at the treatment you got, bearing in mind that like, you don't think you've put that much pressure on yourself and it's all this exterior pressure that's being put on you. Yeah, I think at that point it was, it just seemed mad to be honest because I'd won a few medals and I was obviously a world championship medalist and I was really happy with that, you know, coming from the, 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 the sport that we came from where in Britain we haven't got medalists in it. I thought I'd done really well to break through that and start a new generation almost and um and had hadn't had that much public support for winning. So was kind of expecting whether I won or lost the games it would have been similar to that. Like I had my fan base and they were great. But it wasn't like publicly people were aware of me winning like like world championship medals, you know, and and I kind of didn't expect that then all of a sudden a large population was gonna <laughs> hate me, um, especially because um, our sport is everyone knows it the way it is, isn't it? You know, in our little world, we all know that the best version of hobby ever actually wins, um, phys like the physically the best person. That if you strip the rules, you're down. You know, you're talking about you're skating on this one millimeter thick piece of metal that if you stood on a grit of sand the edge would be stripped and you could go down. Like, it is the finest details that can just, like, I don't know many other sports, you probably F1, the best one to compare it to, where if something's slightly out about their car, you see the drive totally different, and it's the same thing, you know, there's so many things can go wrong, and, yeah. um, and so for us in our world, it was expected that it was going to go wrong at some point, and then for them the next day to just go on and see that, I could not believe it. I felt like, before we went into the Olympics, I felt like this insignificant human who beats skates around in circles, you know. Um, and that's not going to impact anyone, other than the fact that, you know, we want to get our sport out of there. We want to get more people interested in doing it. But I had the dream of being in the medals because I wanted to be the best person at speed skating I could possibly be. Um, and then all of a sudden everyone hated me and it was it was mad, I'm not gonna lie, like I couldn't take it in, um, that because something that happens every competition or every competition some someone takes someone out, you know, um, that's normal, no one holds it against each other in our sport. It's fine lines but that had caused an uproar almost. Um, it just seemed so, and I was still an experience in that distance as well. I hadn't been in a final in anything. I'd never skated a World Championship final in the 500. I'd never been in a European Championship final. I'd never been in a World Cup final. It was my first ever A final and a 500 meters. And that's when I mean I was skating better than I was thought I would. And I was like, I don't even know how to race this distance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, I mean, you meant you refer to it as a minority sport, and 
my own personal background, I used to do fencing, also a minority sport. There's a lot of that, yeah. There's a long time ago, though. Does a lot of that then come from maybe a lack of education from people watching that sport because they don't fully understand just how unpredictable it is and all they see is you taking someone out and they don't actually realise just how common that can, that is during races and short track? I think there's like, yeah, there's the two things and I guess you'll see this point of view as it is evidence that a lot of people don't understand the sport, yeah, um, and they don't even understand how the refereeing works. And then there's also the evidence behind people think that I'm rubbish because on <laughs> what it must be like five out of my 5,000 races I've done, I've messed them up or something's gone wrong. That's it. Like, literally, outside of these Olympics, I've had one penalty in the last four years. So, it's like to be judged as being a crap speed skater when I've got all of these titles and and I don't actually mess up races that often. It, it just does seem it does seem mad, and I guess you can kind of understand that coming from well, you could, because to be honest, I wouldn't have a clue what the rules were in your sport. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's the same thing, and everyone knows the rules of football um, to an extent. They know what's right and wrong, and I feel like it was like I was put in that scenario where people think they know what's right and wrong, um, and, that, and and it's like in football when people see something happen and the referee maybe makes a wrong call because it does happen, people will be like, oh, well, we know the rules, so that is a wrong call. Whereas in the man's point, it was like the referee said it was wrong, therefore it was automatically wrong because they didn't actually understand the rules of the sport. So it was kind of like, yeah, so it was a, a difficult way to see because for me, I've always been very like open and honest and almost I had to take a step back because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know, I didn't want to like say I don't agree with the referee's decision because I didn't want to seem sour, you know, because I wasn't sour. Because it happens a lot in short track that the referee has to make a quick decision and makes the wrong one. But it was like, how do I tell them what's actually happened here? Because I've never been put in this scenario before where I've had to explain my sport to someone. Um, so it was it was a bit mad. And I think that's why I'd love, and I guess you would have loved it as well, with fencing that if people watched it more and seen it more and really got behind the British skaters in terms of like knew them, knew what they were good at, knew you know, it would be so much more exciting to be a part of it. Um, and I think you'd be better watching it because you'd understand what is and isn't okay kind of thing. How long did it take you then to get to grips with handling all of that? Both, I suppose, from, from your own personal side of things, but then going out in the media as well and trying to act as almost an educator, but also trying to put across what you, you really think as well. Well, I think I did work with, I was a Sky Scholar back then, so I did a lot of work with um, Sky on, like, media, sort of, it wasn't really media training, I hate to use that term, it was more like, um, opening up on camera almost, they were like, just be honest, just be yourself, and, and I think to this day, it's not like I went out in Pyeongchang and stood there and explained the decisions and tried to make everyone see my side or see my point of view. Because at the end of the day, like, that isn't the right way to handle it. Um, I want people to be excited by the sport. I want people to enjoy it. I don't want them to think I'm just defending myself all the time. Um, but, and, I, and now I just feel like I'm okay with people judging me because I know my sport. Um, I know the problems in my sport. I know the good parts about my sport. I know what needs to change over the next few years rules and things like this and um and that's all that really matters now um and and, and it's like there were so many things there's so many things go on behind the scenes in any athlete's life or any sport in korea that people will never know or will never see and i can see it now from like an external point of view and i've, I've paid a lot of attention to this how especially like in britain with the footballers how harshly they can be judged for one little mistake it's like they get that every day. I go, I get it once every four years. Like, <laughs> it's, you know, it's 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 looking at the fact that it isn't you. You're not victimized. It's just the way sport is. It's what people do, you know. Um, and 
and, it, and it's kind of like a compliment in a way because it means they're passionate. I think whether they give you positive or negative comments, it, it still means they were passionate about what you were doing and um, and almost probably just disappointed for you. Like when people have a go at footballers, they're not really having a go at the football. They're annoyed that their team's lost. Um, and that's a way to react to it. So I think I've got a lot more like perspective on things nowadays yeah was well that probably the biggest lesson out of all of it was to t- put it all into perspective and grow a thicker skin i suppose is one way of putting it yeah definitely i think it was just because like the difference was that a lot of people are brought up in that situation like as soon as you kind of make it onto the scene you're you're a victim you're not victim sorry that's the wrong word but you're like put out there in front of people to be Scrutinated. I, I, I just had never been in that scenario before. I was literally just like this person that was insignificant, and, and I'm still insignificant. I don't, I don't think that. But I'd never had, I'd had a little fan race, and that was it. And then all of a sudden, I was like, "What the heck is going on?" And and I think uh, where it was different is I was never expected. Even if I'd won an Olympic gold medal, that I wasn't expecting to get that much attention. For it, so yeah, it was a bit a bit scary. <laughs> so turning to 2017, which is the year you become overall world champion, um, the first European woman ever to do it. By the way, take us through the build up then to that event because that, from the from an outside perspective, the preparation for that and your form going into that, that was probably you at your absolute best. But is it maybe because it was it wasn't. <laughs> That that's that's my no, lack I of education there. To myself, uh, <laughs> I was very badly concussed for the months going into the world championships, <laughs> and only had about two weeks to prepare for it. <laughs> I was not my best form. My best form was earlier that season, I mm-hmm. would say. Um, like an assumption that people have made from the outside, I guess. Yeah. So again, it comes down to that because. It's a world championship rather than an Olympics. You're out of the spotlight a little bit. No, um, basically world championships in short track is our most important event. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, okay, the Olympics gives you more opportunities. It gets you out of the spotlight, gets your sport out there more. Opportunity-wise, the Olympics is the biggest event. But for us, it's like short track is too. Short, my short trackers aren't famous. They don't grow in, in all countries, you know. There's only a couple that are. They don't grow up in the spotlight being like, you know, this is going to change my life. We all know that short track isn't going to change your life. But the World Championships is the most important event to us. As a short tracker, it's the most respected event you can win mm-hmm. because it's four distances added together. So you're not just the best in a single event. You've got endurance, you've got speed, you've got skill, you've got you've had to get so many things to reach and off that overall podium. For me, like, the most stressful race I've ever done in my life is the Super Fight on that World Championships because I, I was, it decided whether I was going to be the top of that podium or not. And that that is the most unbelievable thing that I could have ever achieved in my life and it always will be. Um, like, there's no top in that, I don't think. Um, obviously, for my country, as a proud you know, I'm proud British. I'd love to run and stand on top of that overall, you know, Olympic podium and have a gold medal around my neck and be an Olympic gold medalist, but it would never top. It would never top that, I don't think. I mean, I could joke on one, but <laughs> it's not anything to do with pressure or expectation because actually I had a lot less expectation on myself going into the long time because I'd been injured most of the season. Yeah. So does that make 2017 essentially your favourite year because of what you managed to achieve that year? Becoming world champion. Yeah. And also it yeah, was the Sunday yeah. Times Sportsman of the Year yeah. award as well. Yeah, and that was amazing too. Like, I'd say that year of my life was definitely the happiest, best. Like, I was... <laughs> I mean, I've worked so hard for so long and just to go through it and be like, how is this, how is it going so right? Because everyone knows the athlete, you don't get, everything doesn't go great all the time, you know, that's normal. But I, had, I did have a year where everything worked out and everything went well. And I remember thinking when I got the concussion going into it, I was like, 
oh no, um, this is annoying because this is the best I've been ever in my life and less, this could ruin it now. And I didn't even know if I was going to make it back. To be honest, like at the World Championships, I was still a little bit dizzy and stuff. But, you know, <laughs> I just knitted it down and did what I needed to do on the day. And yeah, maybe that isn't what happens at the game. But going into that, I, I don't, you know, I trade it. Um, because it was such a good year. And then moving on then to 2018 and, and the Olympics, and I think when we did a number of special episodes leading up to that, I think the general consensus was that from a British perspective and from your armchair audience side of things, it, there was probably more focus on these Winter Olympics than there had been for a few before. Don't know if that's something you go along with, but in terms of your form, was was something a little bit off compared to what it was in 2017 before the concussion happened? Yeah. Um, so if you did ask me, honestly, out before the game, what I was expecting, I would have said my best distance was the last one, the 1,000 metres, and that's the one I would have said I was going to try and win. Yeah. And that's the one I was capable of gold medaling in. Um, at that point, I don't think I was capable of gold medaling in either of the other two. I think I could have meddled, um, and I would have been honest about that. Uh, but I did believe I could win a gold medal in the 1,000 because that was my focus. It's always been my best distance. And it's I've got, like, I don't know how many European titles in that distance. Like, literally, I know what I'm doing. It's it's, it's my jam almost. Um, <laughs> so, no, I wasn't in the place I'd been in the year before because I spent most of the season injured. I um I had three muscle tears and a tendinopathy in one year, so I almost went from having the best season of my life with one concussion, which obviously isn't a long term injury, um, to having three or four very significant injuries. So I knew physically I wasn't, and that's why the five hundred probably wasn't as good as it had been because the muscle tears were in muscles that you used for starting. Mm -hmm. um, so I was having a lot of problems with my hips. Um, but at the same time, yeah, was super confident that the 1,000 would be... I, I actually turned around to my coach um, a few days before the 1,500 and said that maybe I should skate and just focus on the 1,000. And we thought, no, no, no. You know, it's still a medal opportunity, which is really important, and I wouldn't pass a medal opportunity off because some people would give anything to be in this position where they could even go out and try to skate for a medal. So... You know, I was like, no, we're not going to do that. But my focus was always the thousand. Yeah. Um, mentally, I was, I was, I, I believed that I was going to medal. Um, you know, I did believe that. I didn't think there was any way that I could get all three distances wrong. I was physically capable of meddling in all three, mentally capable of doing it, and um, and I believed it would happen. Um. And, you know, in the 500, I was very close. I got clipped on the last corner. I was in third place until that point. And I actually would have come second because someone got a penalty. So had I not got clipped on that last corner, I would be a silver medal in the 500. You would all be sitting telling a different story about it. Yeah. But that is short track. Well, that's that's the fine margins, isn't it? Because there's the clip on the yeah, last corner on that race. And then imagine if you hadn't done the 1500 metres, the one that you got injured in. And you had focused on the 1,000 metres, then it could all be so, yeah, so different. Yeah, I could be sitting here as an Olympic champion right now or an Olympic medalist. And, and, and I don't think it would have been... It would have been challenging to win it. Um, I don't think it would have been challenging to be in that A final. It was my best distance and it always has been. Um, but, you know, trying to skate with ankle the way it was was probably a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> But what else would you do? I think most top athletes would have done the same thing, to be honest. Unless your sport was, I guess, like, you know, I couldn't have kicked a football, so. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have been able to play football, but, you know, there's limitations. But, uh, it, it was just, it all got a bit unreal feeling after that point, for sure. Like, I remember leading into the game, just having meetings about, like, with whole teams about, oh, yeah, if people get injured, this is the protocol. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way everyone's going to get injured at the games. Come on. And then, obviously, like, Katie got really badly injured in practice. And then, um, so I was like, well, that's, you know, that's, that's scary. But 
surely two members of Team GB can't get injured. That's the guy in the front. And then it happened, and like, I just remember sitting on the board thinking, my poor mum. <laughs> And I'm sitting in the boards injured and almost that was the most devastating part about I mean I was devastated for myself but I knew I knew my mum was there, you know, watching and how I think it's almost worse watching that happen than going through it, do you know what I mean? So, oh yeah, it was mm-hmm. it all just went a bit mad after that point and and it was weird as well because I again found myself in a situation where I was being told what to do, so I wasn't I, I wasn't supposed to speak to the media, and um, I wasn't allowed to talk to my family too much because I wasn't allowed to be seen in public, and, and it was, you know, because they didn't want me to get hounded and stuff, and it does make sense, but at the time you just feel like you want to talk to people, you need your friends, and you need your family, and, and, um, and then I wanted to skate, and they wouldn't let me skate because I wanted to know if I could actually skate. And I wasn't allowed on the ice until the day of the competition. <laughs> so it was just mental. It was. It was so... It's like, what's the one thing that hasn't gone wrong at the Games for at least? There we go. We've done it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's ticking pretty much it every was, single box, isn't it? I know. It doesn't... It's even sitting here now, it doesn't seem real, you know, that that's actually... That would be the most nightmare situation you could ever be put in at the Olympic Games, I think, and... And that's the position I ended up in, going into my best chance of an Olympic gold medal. Yeah. Does that not add maybe an extra bit of worry um, if you've got all these external factors that you also have to think about, i.e. not being seen in public, not being able to have that much contact with your family, or even trying to get something off your chest to the media? Would you have preferred it to be simplified a little bit so you could just solely focus on whether you wanted to or could actually go back out and skate? I think, I, I don't know, I think it's a hard situation to handle. I think the the POA handled it very well. I think they um, supported, you know, if we didn't have the support of the BOA at that point, I wouldn't have even got back on the ice. Mm-hmm. They literally did everything they could to turn that around. And, um, like you're talking, these people got me on the ice with ruptured ligaments and basically snapped tendon and swelling up to my kneecap you know they they did like they and you know they, their advice was obviously you know it's not the best idea to go out and do this but because it's an Olympic game you do what you need to do and we'll support that and I I honestly don't think any other team could have got me back out there I mean with the first goal I was like I wouldn't have been building my foot in a skate because yeah. the skates are molded to your feet so <laughs> um so it was, and, and everyone worked so hard, um, and I think that was what they were focusing on, and I think it was the right thing to do, but at the time it was very difficult, because I just wanted to go sit with my mum and be like, <laughs> what am I going to do? But you know, it was good to keep the emotion out of it, I think, and I didn't I didn't get emotional about it until after I finished that race that day, um, and I got the yellow card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was, was that maybe the biggest decision as well to actually go back out there because a lot of people afterwards some praised you for getting back out there and then there were others who said you shouldn't have it was very difficult for me because if we'd been at a world championship there's no way i would have skated firstly because you have world championships every year and secondly i was badly injured you know um i wasn't just sprained ankle i was the worst injury i've ever had in my career and the worst pain I've ever felt in my life, I think, trying to put a skate on a skate. And I can see both points of view. I can see why some people praise that and some people think it was a ridiculous idea and some people think it was embarrassing. Um, But I think the two things for me is, firstly, I don't skate because everyone else thinks it's great. I skate because my family supported me to do that. My coach has put so much effort into me and I want to be the best. And... I still genuinely believed, because of how good I am at 1,000 metres, that I could medal. I didn't think I was going to win. There was no way I was going to go out and win, because to win you have to be really good shape. But I still believed that I could medal. Um, and I knew that after that race, I had two more days to try and calm my ankle down a bit more and get some training done. Because that's the other thing. I went on to that race and had skated in two days, so my fitness was bad. <laughs> So 
that was part of it. And then the other thing that really kept me going is um, my view on the world is a bit like, so you have most kids are brought into the world as these like innocents who, um, who are very open-minded. Uh, by the time you're an adult, quite often you've got a tainted view on life because things have impacted you, things have happened to you. You feel the right to judge people almost because of your own experiences. There wasn't one kid that turned around to me and said I shouldn't have gone or told me to give up. And for me, that was that was what got me back up um, when I fell on, well, when I got the October on the start line at that thousand and the referee was telling me to get off the ice. And all I had to think about was there was at least 10 kids' messages in my head at that point. And I was like, these people are the people who aren't judging me. They're seeing me from like a a clean, fresh slate and they don't want me to give up and I don't want to show them that they should give up just because of what other people say and that was really the bit that kept me going. I don't. I think if it wasn't for the kids, I wouldn't have because when she stood on my ankle on that start, like, I can't even describe to you what it's like to get a blade in a very interesting <laughs> ankle. Um, it was, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> I can imagine, oh, and that's where, it. yeah, that's where the inspirational nomination comes from, essentially. Well, you've got the benefit of hindsight and all of that. Do, do you still look back at that as a little bit like a kick in the stomach, everything that's happened? Or do you look at it with a more worldly view now? Honestly, at the moment, I'm still very much still changing my mind every day on that. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard, you know, it's like now we're getting back into them. And I know I've got a long way to the next games. And um, and I know I tried so hard to get where I got to. Um, and, and I am a bit more, like, trying to be a bit more what will be will be now because I know that was my main game. I don't think, like, I do still think I can go out and do really well at the next one and medal. Um, but it's going to be harder, for sure, because I'm older now, you know. Um but I'm willing to take on the challenge, you know, and I, I do want to, I feel like sitting here now, I don't have a reason to quit just because some people think I'm not good enough. Um, UK Sport have showed they still believe in me, you know, they've funded me and all these kids, like, who are sitting there waiting to see what happens in four years, whether I manage to do it or not, I want to show them that you shouldn't stop because of what someone said. Like, I, and I'm still very proud of I'm gutted but I'm very proud of myself because I am a world champion and if I had listened to the bullies in school and listened to everyone in Sochi I wouldn't be a world champion and I wouldn't be a world record holder and I would have let people stop me achieving my ultimate dream which was being a world champion and it doesn't matter what everyone views the world versus the Olympics like that was my ultimate dream and I did it so for me, like I don't want to show them that people should let them stop achieving their dreams. Because mm-hmm. because if you look back at everything that happened, to take it away, the one thing you can definitely take out is the inspiration side of things, because you you have emerged as inspiration for a lot of people, as judged by the nomination we've mentioned a couple of times now, which is the the Great Britain's Choice Award uh, for the nation's most inspirational moment. Uh, from Pyeongchang, and that's part of the Team GB Awards, and I believe the winner is announced on September thirteenth. But that must yeah, that would make great. you feel awesome, really, when, when you hear that. And that despite everything yeah. that's going on, people still look up to you as a person. Yeah, and I think, I think it's amazing uh, to just be nominated, you know, next to someone like Lizzie, who's actually achieved her ultimate, I mean, the ultimate public dream as well as her own dream. You know, she's double Olympic champion, and that is insane. And to be up for a nomination next to that, it's such an honour because I'm just like, well, I didn't manage to do that and that's not how it worked out for me, but it still seems like people are still recognising what I did and I I just can't even describe what that means to me and it's literally the thing that keeps me training right now because it's tough just now, you know, it is hard to get out and do what I did before and get myself back there and believe in myself, but the fact that people were like supporting me and like believing me that much, it just keep really keeps me going just now and I still get up every morning and think. Yeah. In a year's time, you know, I'm gonna love this again and 
I'm going to also have all this support and it's just going to be one of the best places I've ever been in. So, yeah, it's amazing. Has it essentially lit a fire, maybe, that you, do you still have all that support? Yeah, definitely. It definitely has. And I think at the time just now, it's definitely the stuff that, that's the stuff that keeps me going just now. And I don't think it's a bad thing to sometimes have external drive. You know, I've driven myself internally for years and years. It's just to have someone, some people out there just helping me through these rough times. Like the messages I get on Twitter now that all the bullies that abusers have camped down on there are just, you know, they are insane. And, and I don't, I don't, my life isn't revolving around making every single person in this world happy because you can't do that. But if I can just help inspire some people and make some people happy and have a you know, positive impact on someone's life who's gone through something rubbish and I've helped them get through it, then you know, that for me is incredible. Absolutely. So then turning to a couple of other topics, and the first of which kind of follows on from what you were just saying, the, the, the social media aspect of things. And obviously we've talked about this abuse aspect, and but there's also quite a, a lot of positive things to come out of it as well. And you're a prominent user of social media. So I kind of wonder what your relationship is with it now, bearing in mind what's happened to you in the past. Or do you still consider it a great way to connect with people? Um, I think it's dangerous. <laughs> um, I genuinely believe it is, it is dangerous, and you hear about a lot of teenagers at school problems with it now, with bullying and stuff. And I'm kind of on the I'm on the grass about it, on the grass about it a bit. Where I'm like, I think if you can handle it, which nowadays I can, it's a great tool because you can communicate with your fans a lot easier and I want to have a good relationship with them, you know, and, and that is important to me to give back to the people who give to me. And I think it's, you know, it's a great way of sharing life because I'm not just this almost <laughs> determined speed skit. I'm also a proper goofball. Um, <laughs> and I have a pretty, pretty sarcastic sense of humour and it's probably the only way to really get that across most of the time. So I think it is good because it gives people a nice insight into each other and I like following other athletes to see what they do and what they're like, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think you, I think people need to be more careful with it than it be that because I think it is, it is very dangerous and people do misuse it a lot and get away with misusing it. And, um, and I do worry about like the future and, and I almost think there should be something like an age restriction on it or... You know, I don't think kids should be on there. I'm not going to lie. I think it's dangerous. Because mm -hmm. I look at the different approaches that some take to it. Like, if you look at the England football team for the World Cup, and they were on it all the time, but then you look at the England hockey team for their World Cup here, and they totally withdrew from it for the entirety of that tournament. Does, yeah. your, does your approach to it yeah. change during competition time? Yeah, so admittedly, during competition, I normally don't do it. Um... I will send things to put on it, and well, like, like at the Olympics, I was on it at points, but a lot of the times it wasn't me that was on it. So I have an input into what goes on, and wouldn't just let someone completely take over because I don't. I still want it to be me, so I don't go on and look and read things very often. I got I got sent. Um, so my agent was sending me the positive messages from kids, and I was reading them that way and my friends were sending me the abusive one finding it really funny obviously <laughs> <laughs> so that was how I was kind of aware of what was being said and what was going on on the internet but yeah I didn't actually go on there much at all um, and it's sad because I did miss a lot of good things on there I think which were really nice but I think I think it is very sensible to try and minimize it because it doesn't impact you more than you think it does I think yeah, but it does help that you can, when the meme tweets come in, you can you can laugh about them now. Yeah, nowadays, <laughs> I think actually the funniest tweet I can't say, my friends still bring up now, is someone made this pit, like, are they called men? Men, men, I can't know how to say it, but yeah. Oh, well, like meme and it was or something. Me. Yeah, a meme, that's it. So I do that all the time. It's being Scottish is a name there. <laughs> like, say, Peugeot instead of Peugeot or something. Anyway, <laughs> so they made this picture from uh, Sports Personality of the Year where I was in my dress and all makeup done and everything. 
and then there was the picture next to it of me like crying in the barrier like falling over and like in a heap and it said um me on friday night versus me on saturday morning <laughs> <laughs> it is funny <laughs> it's like so yeah i do take most of it well the only ones that like i got a really annoyed the other day actually because I was at a set of traffic lights and we've got some younger kids on the team now. We were all out cycling together and obviously when you go out on the road you have to watch out for the kids to bit and be careful that they're all right. When I say kids, they're not actually kids, they're like teenagers, but you know, compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> and we pulled off a set of lights and one of the kids went out a little bit wide on American Lane, but he wasn't even on the other side of the road, he was still on the right side of the road. But he just pulled out a little bit on it and then went back in behind. And this guy beeped as he went past and he scared us all a bit because he did it so loud. And obviously you can fall off if you get scared on a bike. So when we caught up on the next set of lights, I just said, like, why did you beep? And he was like, oh, because you guys were safe and really dangerous and all this. And we were not like, we know what we're doing. And we just went, well, we didn't do anything wrong. And... You probably shouldn't beep at cyclists because it's actually quite dangerous if they get knocked off and things because they get scared. So I said, just be, bear that in mind. And he was like, oh, I know you. You're that failure of a skater who, <laughs> you know, messes everything up all the time. I can't believe that word to use, but I know she just turned around and I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it looked away. And I'm like, people like that, they annoy me. <laughs> like, I'm just like, oh. But it doesn't annoy me and upset me. It's just like, oh, you just don't know what you're talking about, you know. And yeah. Like the whole team were really annoyed about it. But I don't know how you back. It's just like, you know, he's not worth my breath. That's the really. thing. You know, they're not worth your time now. <laughs> and and his wife was so embarrassed as well. She was just like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like. But yeah, so it's like stuff like that can be annoying, but I don't get upset by it now. Like I know behind the scenes what I'm doing and what I've tried to do, and and that's all that really matters now. Yeah, exactly. And now I turn to one of your best friends, Charlotte Gilmartin, who has been on this podcast. Oh, that is my yeah, best she's been on this podcast twice, so it didn't seem right if I didn't actually bring her up in this interview. Um, what's no, it been like to have her alongside you, like throughout everything? Oh, literally, like, she's just been the most supportive, most annoying human on the planet. Like, <laughs> I think out of everyone in training, at training we argued the most out of everyone. Like, if we knocked each other in training and stuff, we'd be like, what are you doing? But it was always fine, you know, because we were so close. But literally, like, we competed with each other, we drove each other on. She was good at what I wasn't in my best, so we helped each other in that way. Um, and I literally wouldn't have got through Pyeongchang without Charlotte. Um, you know, she she cried more than I did about my injury. <laughs> she literally, like, I got back from the hospital and she walked in and she burst in tears. And I was like, don't do that because I've not cried yet. <laughs> <laughs> Go away. <laughs> she was, like, literally, I, I don't know anyone that cared more or wanted me to do to medal more than she did and I'm devastated that she won't be there at the next game when it hopefully happens yeah because that's what um, I was going to ask because she's obviously now yeah, retired she's amazing so. yeah she's she's mm. fully selfless like she's yeah every, she makes everything about everyone else all the time <laughs> <laughs> is it going to be weird not having her around now that she's retired yeah it already is to be honest like I go training and it was weird anyway because a lot of the people I was close to on the team left, so like Charlotte, who I spoke to every day, was with most of the day, so there was only occasions where I wasn't around Charlotte, and she left, so I'm like, she, she's she gone, and I've got no one to moan with, no one to like, always moan about the training with, just like compare blades, compare problems, and then like, there was a few others, like Aiden, he was a teammate, and he was one of my friends, and he left. Josh left, and then I was just like, everyone here is like not my closest friends anymore. <laughs> I was devastated. But it, it's been good though, because we've been able to build new relationships with new people, and it's got me a lot closer to Cat, which is good because she, I think she's going to need a lot of help over the next few years in the next game. She's really focused on like improving now, but yeah, I do. 
I do already miss her, and I don't know. It's going to be so weird at competitions. I'm not going to know what to do with myself. Yeah, you're going to have to find someone else to sort of moan about things to. Well, yeah, but I don't think anyone can replace her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she'll be happy I to hear that. And voice message her a lot, though, and like, <laughs> exactly. So then, to, to, to round all of this on, um, how is training going then uh, and recovery from the injury and what sort of next in the immediate future? Because people have banded about the, the long track skate, uh, speed skating suggestion. Yeah. Um, whether that's true or not, you can say. Yeah, so I haven't started long track yet, but it is going to happen. I just mm-hmm. don't, I haven't been able to afford to buy myself the skates and blades yet because I just spent about £7,000 on new short track bits and blades. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah, they're not cheap. Um, so I need to fund that and get myself some skates and blades at some point. And as soon as I've managed that, then um, then I'll be starting it. So it should be, like, end of this year I get out there. Um, and the UK Sport are very on board with me doing that. They're very keen for me to do that. Um, at the moment... I've been very focused on getting my medal support plan together, which has been very difficult um, because obviously there's a quite a tight budget to try and um, organise everything under now, so it's quite difficult. But so I've been doing that externally, and then on the I just started school full time training again. I'm as, like endurance wise doing really well, so I'm still skating like 20 laps the same PBs I was last year which I think is surprising because you know I was off the ice for like six months with my ankle and my ankle isn't fully back yet it's still very sore but it's a lot better and the strength is there now which is good um I'm lifting more than I've ever lifted in the gym as well so I think then that'll translate onto the ice once I get my kind of coordination back more and this and things like that I'm not super fast just now like I'm probably about two tens off of what I was last year but then four years out of the games last time I was slower than I am now so um so I'm just being patient with that getting the power back in my legs and things and um but yeah everything's progressing and I think I started much faster than I thought I was going to be after that long off so it is very positive um and it's like it's really good because the team's come together really well this year to try and um figure out how everyone else is going to carry on skating and things so we're all working really hard together and being really positive with each other um so yeah so I'm, I'm actually enjoying it as well which is nice so um it's hard to push myself and get up every day and know that this is another four cycles of doing this but um I'm not racing until February or March time this year next well it's this season but next year so I've got plenty of time to figure everything out get back to full strength and give worlds a go and then hopefully next year the March 2020 the goal will be to be world champion again so you seem to be enjoying it especially when you're not getting your hair trapped underneath some weights which I think oh, I saw I on Instagram see that. <laughs> <laughs> which was quite something <laughs> Exactly. And um, with that, we better wrap up this interview. And um, I'm sure me and a whole bunch of other people will join you in wishing you all the best when, uh, with the training. And then when the inevitable comeback um, rocks along uh, next year, hope it all goes well. Yeah. Um, and I know I mean, it's going to be so fun. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, and with that, that's, that's it for me. And thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Thank you for Cheers, having thanks. me. thanks. It's a big thank you to Elise for coming onto our show to be a part of our 50th ever episode. Before we go, as ever, we will point you in the direction of our social media channels. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and we're on Instagram. All of our handles are Pod, And of course, you can get in touch with us via our email address, which is sportsbillpod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our others, please spread the word. And don't forget to visit our website, sportsbillonline.com, 
where you can find all of our 50 episodes, as well as articles from our writing team. Myself and Will will be back soon on October the 14th with our next instalment of Sportspiel, which will be undergoing a bit of a revamp. Feel free to tell us what you like and what you don't like as the two of us try to put together a show that everyone enjoys. That's it from me on this special episode of Sportspiel. We will be back, listeners, in two weeks' time, but until then, take care and enjoy what sport there is on offer.